when when we do go live keep this up for just a few minutes and then take it down when i start to introduce everybody okay Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our fourth um, production by the Cathedral District and topics of interest for people who are um, in Jacksonville and outside of Jacksonville. And today we're discussing public art. Um, I want to tell you that this is our fourth show similar to this. Sometimes it's an in-person production and sometimes it's just um, a webinar like today is. And um, there there are about a little over 60 people that have uh, registered today to talk about this topic. So I'd like to introduce our speakers if we could um, do that. Thanks. Um, let me tell you before I bring in Jessica and Kat um, who we are. The Cathedral District is a a seven year old nonprofit that um, we have been working really hard to redevelop the Northeast quadrant of downtown Jacksonville. It's now called Cathedral Hill. Um, we, we're governed by an independent board of 21 people now. We started out at seven, we've really grown. Our goal is to facilitate uh, 2,500 new residential units in the neighborhood. That's a big number. But to date, we have about 650 residential units either under construction, completed, or in financing. Uh, we follow a master development plan which shows us where the, the residential and the commercial development should be placed for the highest and best land use. And we also focus on placemaking, which is what today is about. We want to be sure to bring the stakeholders of the neighborhood uh, who are living there and businesses that are working there and engage them into the direction of these goals and, and how to achieve them. So I encourage you to visit our website if you want to know more about us or if you want to see the, um, the master plan, it's, it's on our website. Today we have two, two really fabulous experts, one local and one um, national. And the first I want to introduce you to is Kat Wright. Kat is new to Jacksonville, but she's she knows a lot about what we're talking about. She she came to us um, from Chattanooga. She is currently the public art director for the Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville, which is multi-county, I believe. I'm not sure about that. I think it is. Um, at the at the Cultural Council, she provides strategy and direction and implementation of a comprehensive art program. She holds a master's of public administration and local government from the University of Tennessee. And she comes, as I said, with extreme uh, talent that we need in Jacksonville. Um, she, um, she, the Cultural Council, you, you, you need to know, is the official local arts agency for the city of Jacksonville. They annually direct all of the city's competitive art grants to various groups. And we're really um, fortunate today to have with us Jessica Santiago. Jessica is a Jacksonville native, grew up here, born and grew up here, but she's now down in Miami, as you can see from her beautiful background. Um, she's the founder and curator of Art Republic Global, and it's an agency that specializes in contemporary and digital art and immersive public art. She has over 10 years of experience in the art industry and is a di digital art specialist. Jessica has led projects with Samsung, United Nations, Deepak Chopra, Waldorf Astoria, among just a few. Several Jacksonville projects have been led by Jessica also. So let's get started, ladies. And this is a casual kind of conversation. And everybody who's watching, you will be able to ask questions in um, a little... Uh, a Q&A function box on your screen. If you just type them in, we'll try to collect them and find a, a theme to several of them and try to get you answers while we're here today. 
So for either one of you, can, can you clearly define what art in public places means, particularly for Jacksonville, and then perhaps for other cities our size? And um, whoever would like to jump in there, just feel free to jump in. Sure, from, from my perspective, in the simplest of terms, uh, I would say that public art is social impact and economic impact in the simplest of terms. Uh, and it can be a variety of different things in the realization of public art in, in the built realm. Uh, a lot of times I think of it being um, sort of the tension between innovation and regulation as well. Uh, so for Jacksonville specifically, one of the reasons I was attracted to, to Jacksonville uh, uh, after sort of seeing the sort of the national uh, uh, happenings with public art and just arts and culture in general is Jacksonville has a lot of tremendous energy, a lot of great individuals, both uh, at a more formal level with a nonprofit foundations or just even community-based groups that are committed to enriching their public realm with with public art and all of the many wonderful benefits that that come with that, come with that like increased government tax revenue and and healing and reconciliation and and jobs and and all the wide variety of benefits with that so it's definitely something where on a national scale all of that all of those small efforts are are really starting to to take notice on a, on on a bigger on a bigger stage, which I really I, I know it attracted me personally yeah. to Jacksonville. And Jessica, you you have done work here in Jacksonville in the public art arena, but also outside. And talk to us just a little bit about uh, public art here in Jacksonville and where you think we are. Sure. Well, you know, from and and to speak to your to your last sentiment as well. You know, we take a perspective. I always have within our republic of a public art public arts ability to storytell. And when I first started, you know, looking, when we first started Art Republic, we realized I had met with, you know, NS and, and so many historians and so many local people who had been in Jacksonville for their whole life. And when we realized how many incredible iconic stories were not in the public realm, were not captured and people didn't really know them. These were, you know, incredible monumental stories of, of Black history and our stories within the jazz and blues and, you know, really the prelude to the Harlem Renaissance. And I was really moved by public arts ability to storytell. And so our number one goal when we started Art Republic was to put these stories in the public spaces uh, for us in a very contemporary way. And so that's, you know, that I felt like was the a, a big gap that we could help contribute to. But when you look at them now, we have 53 murals across all of uh, all of the downtown core, and each of them tell a story of, of what the city's history is. <laughs> Somebody just gave you a thumbs up. Um, uh, Kat, um, tell me um, a little bit about how they we manage them from a from the public side. I know that um, curating the right artist and curating the right price tag also to go with the artist is important, but once it's up, how is it managed that, um, when it needs repair? Absolutely. So the city actually, because most of, uh, well, all of the art and public places collection is insured on the city's insurance policy. So essentially we work in tandem with the city's risk management division to say, hey, you know, we're going to go in and do preventative maintenance, which could be something like washing, waxing, something that that allows it to the artwork to retain its value. Mm -hmm. And then when we do condition audits, where we just go out into the field and check out the pieces and, and see, you know, how are they deteriorating? You know, what what's the concern? Then sometimes we work with risk management to say, hey, you know, we need to bring in repairs this is what we're gonna do. And we work with the, the city to process those invoices for repairs, for maintenance, because the city maintains all of the money for both the artwork, but also the repairs uh, within the within city financial. So although we're an independent nonprofit that does receive the public funding for, for arts and culture for Jacksonville, all of the money is actually for public art retained by the city. 
Mm. Now, let me ask you, we just showed two examples. This one particularly, I like this one, I think was done by the city mm -hmm. and it's on the Water Street garage and it, it's illuminated at night, which is pretty powerful when you see it. And then the one previously to that, we showed that the two teenagers, uh, it, was that done by you, Jessica, or was that done by locally? But yeah, that was that was by Art Republic. And and talk a little bit about um, how you maintain this. I mean, those silos. I I guess they're silos. You'd call them that. It mm -hmm. it um, lend to to me. They lend to the beauty of the piece tremendously. But how do you maintain them? Are they in the collection that the city would help maintain? Um, so all of our all of our murals were done predominantly, not all of them, but uh, but ninety percent of them were done all on private property. And so when you look at you know the murals actually take very very little maintenance. I mean the lifetime we we specifically worked with the highest quality paints. Uh, a few of the murals that the private owners were very adamant about wanting to really ensure their lifespan and perpetuity. We did put a, a UV clear coat. And with murals, I mean, they are incredibly easy to maintain. A, if you want, you can you know, go over them and create a new one. On one like this, you wouldn't do that. But if we see it begin to fade, we just put a UV clear coat on it and it'll give it another five to 10 years. Well, that's very interesting. Um, so both of you, um... How do you think Jacksonville compares uh, to other cities, maybe larger cities our size, since both of you have experience in other cities? Are we tr kind of like playing catch up or are we leading or are we kind of in the middle? What's your opinion of that? I mean, as, a, as an organization that's worked a, a great deal in Jacksonville and outside of Jacksonville, um, I, I can say that I think it, is, it is, moves much slower then because we have not really put together, we have not really modernized our way of bringing the par private side and the public side together. I think that there is a big opportunity to innovate and really modernize that system so that we can begin to move faster. I mean, just as a couple examples, in our first year of Art Republic, um, the Cultural Council was working on a public art project that was a public-private partnership with JTA and the Cultural Council. And if I recall correctly, I know that that took over two years, if not closer to three. And we were able to, within just private side, be able to raise the funding and the execution, the full startup of, of the company within nine months and put up 12 walls, three major events. So the speed that we were able to get the private side of being able to get the property owners to agree, to be able to get all the agreements in place, to source the materials, I mean, there's, there's just no comparison. But the other side is when you look at a, a groups like Cincinnati. So Cincinnati had a project very similar to Art Republic. It was called Blink. And they did murals, also digital, like we did. And they started off just on their own, very entrepreneurial mindset of, you know, making the project real. But then very quickly, what would be their equivalent to a DIA invested in them. And they created a partnership and they were able to scale dramatically. Today, they have over 2 million people attend their annual festival and they've had $125 million in economic impact. Mm -hmm. They've been able to give 1.5 million in direct artist commissions. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those numbers are, are massive. And when we were looking at really showing, I mean, we start, our project started at the same time. And so we were able to use them to be able to show the public sector, you know, what's possible. The same thing with St. Pete's Shine Festival with West Palms Festival. Uh, Tampa has done something very similar. So I think, you know, being able to identify entrepreneurial talent within the arts and being able to find ways to say, okay, we see what you're doing and we see the value and the effort that you've already put in and being able to then allow organizations like that to scale with public funding. It's the only, it's the only real sustainable model. Otherwise you exhaust your private sources, your private funds, and you know, you're dependent even on the companies. And the biggest challenge that we saw was that even the major brands and corporations that are headquartered in Jacksonville, it still isn't their major market. So they're still not, they weren't really giving the funding in perpetuity. They might do it for one year, maybe two years, but it's not a sustainable model. 
So to be able to have these festivals that have massive ROI that end up developing the brand of the city, but also the economic impact, they always take a, a way for both sides to work together. Yeah. Well, that is a hallmark of Jacksonville, I have to say, after having been in the private sector and the public sector, that we we work um, particularly slowly in, in all of these uh, efforts, even um, public-private venture. And the the sense of urgency has always been missing. And then the opposite side of that is the, the flip side of that is, well, we're dealing with public money. So we're responsible to the taxpayer. We have to be transparent as can be. We have to let other people weigh in on it. That is counterproductive to, to try and make something happen as fast as you can in the private sector. The, I, do, I think that there are ways clearly that we could process something much faster than three years to get it done. Um, and maybe that's something that uh, the Cultural Council can work on through some legislation. I'd be happy to help you, Kat. Absolutely. <laughs> just to, just to complement uh, Jessica's sentiment, I think that she's absolutely correct in that no one entity can can carry all of the weight uh, for you know for developing arts and culture and specifically public art. I think one of the things, especially when you think about downtown murals uh, on city owned property, the, the fact remains, we don't really have a lot of city property in downtown outside of say interior structures like city hall or parking garages uh, for, for me to be able to use public money to put it on city property. So it, so there's a lot of, so each of us in terms of Jessica working, you know, with private developers and then me sort of supplementing her to infuse city owned property with public art. You need, you need all hands on deck to allow, to, uh, to allow the best possible chance of having uh, a city full of robust cultural amenities. And I definitely think in, in respect to you know, how we're trending, so on and so forth, is when I look, for instance, say at St. Petersburg that Jessica brought up, you know, from a government side, uh, St. Petersburg has probably a much more, um, I would say, multifaceted legislation related to, to what we call art and capital construction, uh, where they do have a private side for, for private development and public art we tend to have kind of a basic ordinance in which it doesn't really address private development. And right now, one of the things I, I'm doing is partnering with the Downtown Investment Authority, which is a city entity, to examine funding models and see where we can possibly uh, close the gap and create more opportunity that we haven't had necessarily from the city's perspective. So, so I remain hopeful yeah. Yeah. in that uh, this continued collaboration and, and insight and evaluation is, will be fruitful in the long run. Yeah. Well, Kat, that's a good segue in, into um, the city ordinance that we have. You, you touched on it a little bit. Um, the city ordinance uh, was written many, many years ago and hasn't been looked at for a while. So if there's anybody on our, on our uh, viewership today, like council people, which I think we have one registered, um, maybe we need to pull that out and dust it off and rethink it. But can you explain how the city ordinance manages the set aside that's required for, um, for city projects that go vertical? Sure. So there are two things to know about uh, public art that's publicly funded. Basically the one main pillar we have for funding for public art is ordinance based and it's called the art and capital allocation. And that essentially is when you have one particular fiscal year where the city outlines their capital improvement projects, which is basically vertical construction. And the ordinance for Jacksonville specifies that, uh, that they will give you sort of a set aside based on a percentage for a capital construction project that's at least $100,000. So if I have a project that is a capital construction project in a fiscal year that is half a million dollars, her ordinance are set aside for public art funding is 0.751%. So realistically that provides a funding source, but it's not necessarily a very, um, I think, substantive, funding source when you think about how you can possibly continue to develop holistically the public realm and that it's all 
it's all pretty much tied into whatever capital construction projects are happening that year. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so when they slow down, we have less funding for public art. And then how do you how do you build in congruence with capital construction and public art where it's all baked together? Yeah. So, so the 0.75% then is further broken down in, in legislation to say, okay, so you have a pot of money through the art and capital allocation, which is that percent for art policy, the 0.75 based on capital construction of over $100,000. And now we have to decide how we're going to disseminate it across a city that is 840 some odd square miles, <laughs> which is also an interesting and unique challenge for Jacksonville that no other city has because we're yeah, just so yeah. big. Well, so the allocation in particular says, okay, well, once we've assigned, once we have an idea of where we want to program public art in Jacksonville, and we have a, um, a project budget in mind, depending on what district, the, the ordinance says, okay, 80% of that has to go to the artwork budget, 10% of that has to go to a maintenance set aside and 10 and up to 10% can be reimbursed to the cultural council for administration of that project. So the 80% basically goes for the art for the artist contract that could be local, national, international. And then the 10% side is basically a one time kind of drop in the bucket to maintain that piece throughout its livelihood. So that's a tension point in that the 10% is kind of based on the year that it was erected, right. that piece. And so therefore you have to kind of think about inflation and is it, is that gonna be enough when you're thinking about you know a $40,000 project, if 10% of that is really just 4,000, I really have to think about minding my P's and Q's on how the piece is constructed let, you know, murals are very different because they're very durable, but structures, you have to make really intentional choices in materials, durability, because ultimately, you know, your set aside to take care of it is is only so finite. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's essentially how the, the legislation is constructed right now. So, Jessica, in, in other cities, you mentioned St. Petersburg, but have have you um, found that the, the public-private um, cooperative is stronger there, um, that um, more more robust for the, perhaps for the, whether it's a any kind of public art, whether it's a sculpture or whether it's a mural or, or whether it's a, a something on the road? I mean, other cities, are they working more closely with the private sector? I, I mean, ab absolutely. To be very honest, it's it's pretty dramatically different, and I think it's I think it really stems from you know we really need to reframe the entire idea. I mean, one of the things that every single and I've worked with I think maybe four different you know public art directors and people within cultural council over the years and and different people in DIA and everyone's response to me whether I met with the mayor's office or with city council people was well, it's not on city property. And I think that that's, we're thinking very, very small-mindedly when you look at the fact that we can't just focus on city-owned property. I mean, even in Atlantic Beach, we did a project with them where we created 20 murals and they were all on private property, but the city realized the value and the ROI of a team like ours coming in, doing all the heavy lifting, doing the work, ensuring a high quality product and, and community engagement and they invested in us to be able to do the work. And so, I mean, that's even just as close by as Atlantic Beach. I mean, that was very easily done and it was very easily understood by the residents. We had many, you know, we, I think we had three or four different meetings with the whole community for everyone to come in and weigh in and what did they want to see? So everybody felt very heard. It was a beautiful project, took a few months to put together. And, um, and so even as far as that, we have those smaller examples, but I think really reframing the idea of a city investing in its people, not just this is city property and we can do it like this. I mean, when we see the cities that are the most innovative, they have the public sector has begun to have a very entrepreneurial mindset and they're looking at their people and who do, who do we invest in and what organizations 
are we willing to invest in and you know make the uh, uh, empower the people who are willing to get in there and do the work mm -hmm. i mean for to show another extreme example we're working with jamaica on a full smart nation development now granted we come in as the arts organization working with many many a team of 80 different other technology companies but they are it's a four billion dollar project that's taken two years that will start this year so when you look at that scale they're looking at really redoing the entire infrastructure of education waste management housing but we're the art and culture arm of that to be the front facing side so what they as a nation say this is what we've done to pour into our people all public private funding but it's important to them to be able to have a way to tell the story and have something that's front facing that tells the community, this is who we are and this is what we've invested in. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned by those other models. So Kat, I'm, I'm glad you guys are starting to talk about it with the city. We, we had a question that was kind of relevant to what we're just talking about here. And the there on on the North Bank River Walk, there is a wonderful um, sculpture. Uh, it's a monument to those who who died in 1901, the 1901 fire, the Great Fire of Jacksonville. But there's no attribution on it that tells you what it is, what it's all about. So, is there something that prevents these pieces in Jacksonville from? from having um, an explanation to them. Uh, the, there's another huge sculpture on the North Bank River Walk behind the YWCA that I was involved with, with bringing to Jacksonville. Um, Broward Hatcher was the artist and it was for Congresswoman Tilly Fowler. Mm -hmm. and, um, there is a, an explanation all around the base of that of what that represents and um, and why it looks the way that it does. So it, is there, it should, do you think, Jessica and both Kat, do you think that there should be some kind of explanation with some pieces that are rather large like that, or should they should be left up to the person viewing it as to what they are? I feel it. it is always, you know, to Jessica's good point about the storytelling opportunity and, and not only the story, but the history behind it. I think that any type of signage is, is complimentary, is very much needed. As I think what I see in Jacksonville is the Cultural Council, although we receive public funding, we're not actually embedded in the city. And so a lot of times you may have a monument or something else that is erected by say a historic commission or some other entity. And it could be an artwork because it's sculpture, but whether or not the the person that is that is really leading that project will think about adding in, you know, signage, so on and so forth. That's where that dual partnership needs to come in because it's it's our, our entire collective realm. And I think it is important to make sure that we do have signage and we and we do and we do have um you know that storytelling element and pay respect to the artist who actually created that work. So I think that's a that's a huge opportunity in that as we have more public art. Uh, for Jacksonville as a whole, signage for all of that public art, regardless of whether or not the city did it, or a private developer did it, or another entity within the city like Historic Commission did it, I think is going to be really critical to just tell the story of what exists in our public realm. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree that. with you. And you feel the same way with the storytelling part, right, Jessica? I do. And I think, you know, again, looking at things from an innovative way, I mean, we put together, I put some, together so many proposals of things we wanted to do with Art Republic, but we actually had a team put together an app that would be interactive, that would show all the public art. Our goal was always to be able to encourage as many tours as possible, because that would feed business into uh, the local restaurants and the local businesses in downtown. And so we, I, I shared it with like maybe visit Jacks and with, you know, anyone that we could lend an ear to, but, you know, being able, there were so many local companies were known for so many great local technology companies, and they were more than willing to do it at cost for us to be able to have an app that show you know, people could use for tours. And when you look at that, it's a, it's much more modern, younger people are going to use it. We have a very young demo age, you know, average age in Jacksonville. We have a young demographic that's living downtown that has an interest in living downtown. So, I mean, those are, that was one of the things that really helped with even neighborhoods like Wynwood as they put all these walls up, but then they had tons of tours that would go and help people engage with it. 
And those stories were, were fundamental to people really having a, a sentiment and a connection to the city. And, you know, we've even, we made sure that was the first thing we did when we worked with Go Tuck In. We're very, very proud of how much they know the knowledge base that they have of all of the stories of our murals. But we would record as much detail as possible, even like the little nuances of how, how the project got done and what the artist was thinking and the historical piece that, you know, context that they're referencing. So those, um, you know, those stories are powerful, not only for the attribution to the artist and everything else, but really for the ROI, for them to be able to have an economic impact. Yeah, the, the slide that we have on the screen right now is so interesting to me. Um, it shows where all the murals are essentially in the cathedral district. And you can see we have a lot of them. As a matter of fact, I've forgotten the percentage on one of the other slides. It was like 70% of the murals are in the, in the cathedral district. So a lot of them are done privately. Um, I know that um, uh, the big dove that was done by Alex Safakis's group was paid for privately. And um they're managed privately also, but there's a lot of them. And what we are doing, I'll talk about it a little bit later, is a walking tour, an architectural historic walking tour of the district in December. And they will include this uh, plethora of uh, public art because it's so rare to have it all in one neighborhood. So um, while I've got you in this, in this mode of talking about where they go, let me ask you both, how do you select the artist? Do you do a national call? Do you have a committee that selects the artist? I mean, how do you, do you have one individual that you reach out to? How does that work? Jessica, how does that work for you guys? I mean, we took, so our, our agency is a curation agency. So I had spent, uh, we did, it was very different doing it from a private side. We really took a, a approach of wanting the highest and best. So when we first started, it was, we want a collection that can hold its own on an international level. When we started looking at neighborhoods like Wynwood and even neighborhoods in Berlin, at the time when we started Art Republic in 2016, the mural festivals were across the whole world. So you have very prominent, really important artists. And, but where they were putting up murals, they often, because these cities were so robust, they would go over them. Like in Wynwood, you'd have an iconic, very important muralist, but then they would paint over the wall every other month. And so we realized that we have an opportunity in Jacksonville with it being a historic neighborhood on the river, all walkable, to really be one of the only true outdoor museums that encompasses some of the most iconic names in street art alongside local and regional artists. So we worked backwards from that end goal in, the, in our selection process. So we have right now a slide up that shows um, a, a whole bunch of Art Republic, Art Republic um, projects. And maybe you could pick out one or two and tell us what is, looks to me like is the, the, the Sydney Opera House, but where, where are they and uh, um, how long did it take to do them? So over the years, so we actually started working in digital art in 2016, it was always something that it was important. What was interesting is we started in digital um, in Jacksonville, but I wanted Jacksonville not only to be, you know, we have this reputation, we grow up there, we can candidly say, we know that we have a reputation for being a little bit behind and often a little slow to the party. And so when we had all these muralists coming, we didn't want to just say, okay, now we're having a mural festival after all these other cities had, we want to also have digital as well. That way we have something to have our stake in the ground that's new and really innovative. And so we started doing these digital art exhibitions. I think there may be one or two on there that are from our first show. Our first show was a major big show at this scale was in 2017 um, at 100 North Laura. And we worked with Baptist Hospital and Ackerman Cancer Center. So it was designed around this wellness ethos. But you know, what's beautiful now is you know, digital art medium exploded in 2021. And so when people found out that we were doing it in Jacksonville in 2017, it became, you know, we really became experts in the medium. So these are everywhere from, I mean, there's one, if you look the third one in at the top is with Deepak Chopra in Miami during Art Basel. The other ones on the other end of that row are at Samsung in New York. There's some that are um, in New Zealand. 
There's one that's in the Shanghai airport. The one in the bottom row it, in the kind of in the middle, the kind of blue green one is actually at Harvard University. It, it's been incredible because when we first started at Art Republic, we started with this ethos of the merging of art, technology and wellness. And we did that. I used to have groups of maybe 20 of our young creatives, all 20 somethings. And we would just have them sit down and throw off ideas of what's important to you. What do you, you know, what do you love about Jacksonville? Because we were really searching for a solution to this problem we've always talked about of what's the brand of Jacksonville. And so one of them said, let's start off by naming all of what our strengths are. And so we knew that art is embedded in the DNA all the way from the prelude to the Harlem Renaissance. We, I found out that, you know, Jacksonville is considered the next emerging tech city. We have one of only 30 of the next gen Apple stores. When I reached out to Apple's marketing team to ask them why Jacksonville, they said, we look up all of the patents and where they're coming from. And that's how we determine where the next tech cities are. And Jacksonville is producing a, a plethora of technical patents that are, that are really impressive. And then wellness landed on not only being a coastal city, you know, being in Florida, farm to table community, but also a, being a well tourist medical destination. And so we landed on art, technology and wellness, and then wanted to communicate that through immersive digital installations. And luckily that narrative has gone very, very global at this point. Hmm. That's great. And so you're collaboratively pulling the ideas together from many different artists. You're not just picking one artist in, in most cases. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Yeah. It's, you know, it's uh, tons and tons of collaborative work. I mean, we'll pull in and ask people, you know, what do they want to see? But we always do it really from the creatives themselves. And we create these collectives of the creatives. I mean, from our opinion, I think there's there's a big, you know, we look at the, the difference in how a public sector functions and a private sector. You know, you I would be pretty amazed to be candid about, you know, I would sit in some of these meetings and people that would have opinions on art, there were very few artists and creatives participating in those meetings. Mm -hmm. And these are the people that not only is it their discipline, is it their, their craft that they've mastered, but those are the kind of fresh new ideas that the conversations should start from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Kat, how do you how do you do? I think uh, the process I've been involved with a couple of them is that you do a call, and then a, a selected committee reviews the proposals, and then you select the artist. So it's really different, completely different. So somewhat in the sense of you know we really kind of begin with the end in mind to say what is what is our funding. So if we go back to that 0.75 allocation, you know, when Jessica's mentioning, you know, in 2021, 22, when digital installations are really, you know, uh, booming, uh, if I were to go back and look at my art and capital allocation for that year from city funding for, for like 1920 fiscal year, I only got $197,000 from, from that art and capital allocation, which is... Whew, how, how do how do we stretch that? How do we make how do we make um, you know dreams happen with with <laughs> public art when when you've got that when you've got that sort of set aside? So really, when we think about what what the budgets going you know what budget we have to work with because the art and capital allocation through the ordinance is our main source of public art revenue. Although we can get supplemented by other legislative initiatives, mostly by you know, the mayor or council member discretionary funding, the biggest, most consistent pot of money is that art and capital allocation. So Jacksonville, I think, is interesting in that where I say, okay, I've got this pot of money, how do I best program it? But then also knowing that certain art forms take longer to develop. So we have distinctly four ways we can possibly, according to ordinance, select an artist. What you described, Jenny, is very much a call, and that's basically more or less like an RFQ or a quest for qualifications, where we can do a national call, an international call, local, regional, what, whatever the project really demands. And for some technologies, you know, I'll, I'll use Jessica's example of digital installations. You know, we have a very small market of local artists that could possibly could possibly do that. You know, so in that case. 
if I if I did an RFQ, I would most definitely want to do a national call. Or conversely, other than an RFQ, which kind of resembles a construction bid, I could do a limited competition. A limited competition is where the art selection panel and staff could sit there and say, okay, we're gonna do a, we're gonna do a digital installation, but it's also going to be rooted in history. And so we wanna, you know, like however dynamic it gets, you have different selection methods in that a limited competition just basically allows us to pull who we want to possibly consider. And then the other two methods uh, are sort of a, a direct purchase, which given public funding, we hardly ever do because that's not, in my opinion, uh, really appropriate with public funding for one entity to just say, I'm just gonna purchase you know, whatever, whatever I want. Uh, very, very different than it would be possibly in private development where that's mm -hmm. pretty much status quo um, because it's, it's, it's their money. Uh, and then the last but not least is the invitational. Although it says invitational, the invitational by itself is a direct selection. So it actually is you've got a direct purchase, but the direct selection is is the method that would allow you to select somebody to then develop a public art, uh, a public art form. So mm -hmm. you've got four different ways, and the ones that we we use most pervasively is the request for qualifications through a call. Okay. Well, to, if, if you have any questions about what we're talking about, we sure would love to hear them, um, and we'll try to flesh them out while we've got everybody with us. we got a few minutes left here. Um, let me let me go to Jessica for a second. Can you give us a kind of a ballpark figure of the price tag on an installation of what we just saw a screen of where there are so many? Are, the, are we talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, I assume, or are we talking up to a million dollars? And is all that money um, raised from the private sector uh, and who raises it so that we can up the game? Yeah, from from a digital art side. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so to give you an example, we did a, an installation on One Ocean Hotel in, in Atlantic Beach in 2021, and that you know the the city funded the murals. So we did mural 20 murals, and then we also did an event and a digital art installation. We projection mapped on the whole exterior of One Ocean Hotel, an oceanfront hotel that was special because it was the first full capacity event in the country after COVID. And so we wanted it to be a symbol of people coming back together, having this wellness moment for the community. It was a, a public meditation. It had an audio by Alan Watts and we got the rights to license his audio from. That was 75,000. And that was up for five days. That is, you know, and the one thing I will say um, with Jacksonville, one of the most incredible parts of working in a realm like that and that in that community is the, the buy-in from the community. I mean, we got, uh, you know, the audiovisual company, ABI, to give us a phenomenal deal. We had artists that worked all throughout the whole night to help with labor costs. I mean, from the very beginning, even our, our, our numbers in Jacksonville are a little bit skewed, honestly, because we had paint donated. We had lifts, you know, at, at discounted prices. We had volunteers that would work around the clock. And so all of our murals in the beginning, I mean, they're, they're worth four times what we actually ended up paying for them. But from a digital side, anywhere from, so say the other, the monolith that we've been putting up in Miami every year for our Basel, that's 150,000 and it's up for a week. Yeah. Um, well, that's reasonable, I would think, um, for the magnitude of what you did. One of the questions that has come in is, is talking not so much about budget and funding sources, which is always the driver of making something happen, but ways to look at um, the beauty in our city, something that everyone in the community can that is thinking about. And most people focus, when you talk about Jacksonville, they focus on the St. John's River, the magnificent St. John's River. Um, but um, how do you go about, uh, both of you, deciding what neighborhood or the characteristics in a neighborhood, what's the mindset of the neighborhood or the private in investor who wants to do 
um, something public like that. Um, how do you flesh out that information? So from a publicly funded art project, I, I love this question because this is this is what actually keeps me invested in the job is, is working with the community and empowering the community to really have ownership of what is built in their community. And so from a public art perspective, you know, this conversation has been, you know, very rooted into how we get funding, ordinance, things of that nature, but that's just one piece of sort of the fabric of it in the sense of a lot of times I will say, okay, I have this pot of money and I can possibly look to use it in this downtown core or in District 10. And maybe I'll go in uh, sort of as a preliminary scoping phase before a call is even launched to say, to do education with the community about what possible uh, art forms exist. Uh, you know, Jessica's been talking about, you know, digital installations. We actually have the great pleasure of doing uh, in process a digital installation for District 10 at the Legends Community Center. And that predominantly is not traditional where you'd see a digital installation program because it's not in the downtown core. And so through that experience working with that particular community, they really were like, hey, we want to see something much more innovative and bring it to my community. And so I didn't know what the medium was going to be until we worked with the community, engaged with the community to kind of tell them, you know, and educate them rather on what could be possible, what would be the best art form for their community with the budget in mind, where do they want to cite it in particular. Um, I, especially being a newcomer to Jacksonville, I rely on that community touch point so very much because mm -hmm. then otherwise I don't want to make arbitrary decisions <laughs> about somewhere that I've just sort of moved to. So mm -hmm. we do a lot of initial scoping with the community before we even launch a call. Mm -hmm. Then our panels definitely have a cross section of the community on it. They're all open to the public to provide feedback on the designs. And then we celebrate with the community at a dedication um, we, we engage throughout the public art process at multiple levels with the community so that they really can feel ownership of, of what is happening in their neighborhoods. Uh, you know, the most interesting thing about it for me is I have community members that will just text me on my phone and say, this is still broken. Where are you? And I'm like, I'm on it. <laughs> and that, and that's, and that's a really fascinating, uh, fascinating, I think, multiplier effect and how they still feel ownership now that it's in their environment, which mm -hmm. I really, really enjoy. There's a, a, a beautiful example of um, <clears throat> what I would just call a private public collection of a piece that's in front of MD Anderson that the Haskell mm -hmm. um, our family contributed to. And I don't know if that was yours, Jessica, or whether that was a city piece, but it is a, uh, they're, many, many uh, thin red, um, I don't even know how to describe it, it's up in the air that that is a replica of supposedly the Great Fire. And it, it moves with the wind. It's absolutely spectacular. And it's right on San Marco Boulevards in front of MD Anderson. But how does that idea come to the forefront, Jessica? Does the, in that particular case, did, did MD Anderson or Baptist, did they collectively decide to do that? Or did they invite a private artist to come and do it? I mean, how, how does that come about? I mean, I think that was probably one of the most well done large projects because of how many different organizations came together. I mean, there were many different private entities involved as well as the cultural council. I mean, that was a really robust, we were not a part of that, but there, were, there was a really robust uh, group that took a very, um, highly curated approach to it. And many, many people within the arts that knew, you know, had the aesthetic eye, had the refined eye, but also knew the local community. So it was a beautiful mix, I think, of national, local, regional. I mean, and many of my dear friends of artists that are a part of that. It's very well done. So both of you ladies, what, what are ways that some of our audience are asking, how can they be more involved with our community to bring more public art to Jacksonville? What are things that, that come to mind that we might be able to do? Is it to talk to our local leadership at city council meetings, to write letters, uh, to be involved with the cultural council? I mean, what, what would be some of the examples of how to em, um, embrace the idea more for Jacksonville? So at a basic level, I definitely think uh, it is important to connect with your local council person. 
uh, because as I mentioned, you know, some of this funding, although although I'm given funding for the entire city's construction per every single year, where I program it is really kind of at the city's discretion in that, you know, most of a good 83 pieces of our 106 pieces of public art that this that's in the city's arts and public places collection is already downtown. So I actually have an opposite problem where I have a lot of people wanting me to program outside the downtown footprint, which I think is is really valid and wonderful. And I think that it is always important for the community to know who their council person is, to write to their council person, because council people will also at times have discretionary funding that they can lend as seed money to support a project or to carry over uh, to different fiscal years uh, to and to honestly really have the ability to pilot certain things uh, that we don't seem to have a lot of just yet in Jacksonville. I think it's completely, completely appropriate for uh, community members to say, you know, I want this type of public art, but it doesn't necessarily have to be permanent. We can have more, you know, temporary that has a limited lifespan uh, and we can, we can adjust, we can adapt. And that's kind of really um, counter to the government's construct. You know, government construct is like, it's built, it's here, it's, forever <laughs> and that and that's and that's that's kind of the innovative thinking that that I spoke about earlier in terms of regulation and innovation that we've got to get a little more a little more comfortable with tipping the scale either which way and then another side on just you know bringing uh, public art to your community is anytime there is a uh, a public art project that is slated for for your neighborhood, uh, feel free to serve on an art selection panel. There is a way on our website, www.culturalcouncil.org to indicate uh, that you would like to serve on a panel. And that is a really great way to be involved on the curation, the selection of the artists, lend your feedback. So there's a number of different ways to do it. Mm. Um, all righty, well, um... Jessica, did you want to add anything to that? I mean, I think for me, the most important thing would be to have people, local people actually challenge leaders to really re look at new models. I mean, I've heard the exact same responses from the entire time I've been in the arts in Jacksonville, and it's always the budgets are thin, they don't spread too much. It's, it's this person, it's this person, it's this person, where I think when we look at the cities who have done it really well, it's, they're looking at the ROI. They're looking at, okay, we have this huge festival. People want to see more arts. It's always, I, the question comes up every single time I've ever done anything within the community. How do we get more involved? How do we, you know, play a role in this? And I think, you know, cities are completely brought to life with these festivals. And, you know, the impact of them is huge because you build community, people get to have a voice. There's, you know, there's the high, the high and the low opportunities, whether it's, you know, a local person. Like even when we first started at Republic, there were only three local muralists who had ever worked on a lift. And so we brought in national muralists to mentor them. And now 90% of all the muralists in Jacksonville are working at large scale. So, I mean, that's the, the way that these kinds of festivals and the more, um, you know, consistent community act activations happen. Uh, I think that's where people can daily be involved and can be more involved, but that takes really rethinking how our systems work because they are quite dated and that would solve this problem of there's never enough funding and it doesn't stretch far enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, a fresh look um, at since this uh, ordinance has been around would be a great idea, I think. Um, and just to, to, um, to show you that we're, a little better off than we were before. Before we had the ordinance, I've told this story before, it was 19 city council people who were div divvying up the money, <laughs> which was hilarious at times. We thank you. We thank absolutely you. hilarious. <laughs> you gotta start somewhere, right? You gotta start somewhere. Yeah, well, I, I wanna tell both of you that um, I think our city is richer and better off uh, with your experience and your devotion to expanding the art scene here in Jacksonville. I wanna thank you both for doing this. Um, in the future, 
Um, we have some other things planned. I want to do a little plug for CDJ here. On May 16, we are um, doing a program similar to this with a national spokesperson and a local spokesperson on driving change in the district, the power of two-way streets. And on July 24, we're doing adaptive reuse of commercial buildings, which is a hot topic these days. And on December 7, it's an in-person walking, architectural historic walking tour of the district um, on the first week of uh, December, close to Christmas time. So I wanna thank you all very much. And I particularly wanna thank our sponsors, which are shown on the screen, but I'm gonna do a little quick rundown for you. Um, Purse Becker Foundation, Elena Flats, JEA, Aging True, Baker Design Build, UF Jax Lab, Casper Architect, which I'll do a little plug for them. They are the newest commercial um, entity that has moved into the Cathedral District. Their headquarters downtown is being um, renovated right now. JWB, Shaycor, Michael Dunlap Architects, and AE Engineering. Without support like this, we couldn't continue to do these. So we want to thank you personally. I personally thank you for um, your contributions. And I want to uh, wish you all a good luck. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.